Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Global Tracheostomy Collaborative Webinar Series on COVID-19. Uh, we're truly glad that you chose to join us as we navigate this COVID-19 public health crisis for individuals and families living with a tracheostomy. I recently attended our Patient and Family Advisory Committee meeting at our hospital um, here at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And I went into the meeting with a preconceived notion that the whole talk is going to be about making sure the patient's needs were met and their rights were taken into consideration during this pandemic. But to my surprise, the whole meeting's conversation surrounded around protecting healthcare workers. They wanted to make sure that their nurse and their doctors were safe and healthy, uh, which just shows how altruistic they are, even uh, during the, these crazy times. Um, and so over the last four webinar sessions, we focused on protecting healthcare workers, which is extremely important to ensure that we have a healthy workforce to provide the best care for our patients. But today we're gonna to be focusing on the most important stakeholder in our healthcare industry, our very own patients, uh, specifically those individuals living with, their, uh, with a tracheostomy, and their caregivers. The objectives of this session are to discuss the challenges that individuals with a tracheostomy are facing in the community, recognize the value of partnering with patients, family members, and caregivers in this fight against COVID-19, review the role of multidisciplinary team in the community, and provide recommendations for patients, family members, and caregivers on how to care for themselves during this crisis. Uh, so our webinar is sponsored by an unrestricted educational grant from Medtronic. Um, most of our, all of our speakers are not funded this, by this particular industry, uh, but our speakers will disclose if they have any um, disclosures. Um, during this session, feel free to type in any questions that you have into the questions section. Uh, towards the end, we will be um, spending some time addressing all of these questions um, as experts on this panel. Um, at this time, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Michael Brenner. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction, Vincia. So we have an incredible slate of speakers today uh, that really touches home with what the heart of our efforts are in medicine, exploring the issues uh, from the perspective of patient, uh, of caregiver, uh, and of those most intimately involved in the process of meeting the needs within the community. So I hope that this will provide a valuable window into uh, what the experience is once we leave the hospital walls. Our panelists include, uh, who I'll discuss uh, in present in more detail as we meet them individually, uh, includes Aaron Ward, who is the parent of a child with tracheostomy, Barbara Bosworth, who is a nurse who herself has a tracheostomy, Lucy Klonikdar, a senior speech pathologist from Australia, uh, Rob Graham, who is the leader of the CAPE program, which bridges the uh, gap between the hospital and home, which is a Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, at Harvard. Uh, Lauren Perlman, who is one of the charter members uh, in spearheading that effort with CAPE along with Rob. Uh, Cora O'Leary, uh, who's a community health nurse from Ireland. And Louise Edwards, who's an incredibly passionate speech language pathologist from the United Kingdom. I also want to make sure that we uh, recognize Sally and Jenny, who's here uh, from Australia as well. Thank you so much. So we're going to kick off with Aaron, who's really been uh, a guiding light for us in the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative. Uh, probably most importantly, she's the parent of a wonderful young man, Will, uh, a child with a tracheostomy. She serves as one of our board members of the GTC. She also chairs the Patient and Family Committee uh, and has uh, been a co-author on a number of uh, publications and other uh, projects uh, relating to disseminating best knowledge and practices around tracheostomy. She's going to give us uh, uh, a lens from the patient and caregiver standpoint of what it means to be a, a caregiver uh, in times of COVID-19 and the pandemic. 
Thank you so much, Michael and Vincia. And I'm so excited to be here today and to highlight patients and families in this webinar. Um, one of the greatest privileges I've had is um, serving as the patient and family committee chair and having a chance to connect with patients all over the world. And there's so many themes that arise to the surface that we have in common. And the COVID-19 challenges are not dissimilar to that. Um, some, these are the, some of the things that we're most hearing about. First of all, um, one of the challenges is, you know, before COVID-19, it's always a challenge to find um, qualified and skilled care for the home. And now with in the introduction of personnel issues that we're facing with home care nurses, that's been a real challenge. Something that Lauren and um, Barb will also speak about is the availability of durable me medical equipment as um, the front lines need these highly technical equipments that we use every day. Shortages are starting to show up in the home care as well as the difficult um, the difficulties with getting PPE in the home. Also continued access to care as hospitals have closed their specialist clinics and elective surgeries. There's been concerns about what type of access we would have as existing patients and families. As well as the topic of healthcare rationing that unfortunately this pandemic has driven many countries to think about and to have to deal with. And for our patients and families that have um, vulnerable issues and underlying health conditions, it's been, it's been a conversation that we need to continue. And my, my next slide is going to speak specifically about a decision-making guide that was created by Complex Care, um, a Complex Child magazine, and it's a way to think about how to decide to keep your nurses or not. So one thing you can think about is the, the nurse or the caregiver have another job, and if they don't have another job, and they are also social distancing themselves, then it's probably safe to keep them in the home and the lower risk. If the family or the nurse or caregiver is not social distancing, then maybe it's not a great decision to keep them continuing providing care at this time. You also have to think, do they work with other families and other homes? And if so, how many? And if it's one family and you know that family is also social distancing and committed to that, then maybe it's a, a safe situation or a safer situation. If it's more than two families, the number of um, families and complications and exposure to risk grows, as well as if you're working in the hospital or clinic or a nursing home, where we know that the instances are so much higher. So this was a great um, guide that I found, and I think that it's very much similar to the, the thought process that my family has used in thinking about continuing nursing care, and thought this might be helpful for others as well. The other main issues I wanted to highlight in my brief talk was the idea that this is the time for you to be thinking about what kind of plan you would want in place for yourself or for your loved one with a trach. We do try to maximize care at home if possible. The best way to do that is to be in communication with your most trusted care provider. I'm very fortunate my son is part of the CAPE program with Dr. Graham and Lauren, and they've been very helpful in having conversations with ourselves and other family members and, and other people they serve, what was going to be the best plan for them to really individualize that. It's also a great idea to connect with others in your area to be aware of what the status is of the hospital that you would most likely go to. And also, also to rally around um, advocacy efforts, whether that's helping to acquire PPE for the front line workers or advocating for home care issues. And then also we know things can change. What's your contingency plan in case you have a family member that becomes ill and can no longer provide care for you? And I just want to say that we've all overcome incredible adversity and we're probably one of the, some of the most prepared individuals and families to take on these issues and that we really can do this together and continue the conversation to really increase our tracheostomy community. So thank you, Erin. That was a really wonderful talk. And we're going to, uh, these are kind of lightning talks, and we're going to reserve most of our questions till the end. But there is one that I think is particularly important that I was hoping you could, we, you could speak to before we have Lucy speak, which is for those families that make the very difficult decision that they're not going to continue to have a nurse uh, involved in care of their loved one uh, where they are accustomed to that. Uh, do you have any wisdom to offer on how people adapt to that change? 
Yeah, I think that you really just have to prioritize the care. And for example, if your individual is still continuing to go to school and things like that, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to try to do it all. I think we're all in the mode of right now we need to do what's best to keep ourselves healthy and um, really just enjoy the time together since we really can't go a lot of places. So just really prioritize the care and don't don't feel like you have this is a time where you have to do everything and accomplish everything. And to remember to, to do self-care checks too and, and take some time for yourself if you can. Well, thanks, Erin, for all you do. We're blessed to have you as a friend as well as a colleague and partner in this journey. So now I'll introduce Looney Bonakdar, who is a speech uh, pathologist in Austin Health. Uh, she actually is part of the TRANS team, which is the tracheostomy review and management services team uh, in Melbourne that, that really has set the bar for us uh, around the world. She's uh, put together a very nice talk for us. So she's also worked tirelessly with Sally and Jenny uh, in putting together a really nice video that I think will help give you a real window into life in the community in the era of COVID-19. So with that, I'll give it to you, Lucy. Thank you. I'm excited to introduce Sally and her mother, Jenny, who are both incredible supporters of the GTC. Sally has needed to spend almost two and a half years in hospital due to a serious lung infection in conjunction with a neurological condition and is now invasively ventilated via a tracheostomy. Most of her time in hospital has been spent under the care of the Victorian Respiratory Support Services Unit based at Austin Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. In February this year, Sally managed to successfully transition home. Only a matter of weeks after discharge, the COVID pandemic hit. Sally and Jenny will now speak to their experiences transitioning home and now navigating the COVID pandemic. Thank you, Sally and Jenny. spent almost two and a half years in hospital in Melbourne, 90 minutes away from our home. This was a very difficult time. The VRSS, the trams and the nurses on Five West have been of great encouragement to us. I'm very grateful for how they have encouraged us and equipped us to care for Sally at home. I'm very grateful for my great team of nurses and parents and our systems at home have been working well. We have emergency backup from our local mobile intensive care ambulance. The restrictions caused by the COVID pandemic have added complexities. The staff's agency has issued instructions on how we can reduce the risk to Sally. Some of our staff who have been traveling on public transport have been asked not to. Another one who developed a temperature during a shift had to go home early. And some of the staff who've got children now work doing schooling at home are finding things more complicated. We've lost a few team members also, and we are concerned about the impact of the coming winter and flu season. The pandemic has also been difficult for us in relation to getting supplies. Not being able to see my wider family has been hard. My sister, her husband and three month old daughter canceled plans to visit us from England. So I cannot meet baby Zoe in person. We must also miss celebrating my other niece's first birthday. Many friends were unable to visit me in hospital, but they were looking forward to being able to drop in on me at home. The restrictions have stopped that too. I had hoped to be able to do lots of fun things which I had missed out on, but now I can't leave the house. Our ambulance crews have been very kind. Both times they have transported me home from the Austin, they have stopped at an ice cream parlor. Now I'm home, I have been able to cook, build with Lego, make cards and do some gardening. I have a bird feeder outside my window so I can watch lots of colorful visitors to our fly-through restaurant. I've also enjoyed getting outside with my dog, Lily. We've been taking daily photos to create memories of what I have done. My grid pad has been a wonderful communication tool as it gives me a voice. 
A dream of caring for Sally has come true. Our advice to others is that it's not easy, but it's possible. It takes patience, readjustment, listening to good advice, lots of support, and most of all, great teamwork. So I want to thank Sally and Jenny, uh, as well as Lucy, for sharing those insights that really come from the heart. I think that we can all relate to those instances of missing out and experiences that didn't happen, but also finding opportunities to thrive. In my role in medical education, I've actually had a few students who had their weddings canceled and other major life cycle events. So we've all been affected in various ways, uh, sometimes inconveniences, uh, other times extremely profound. What really struck me was that even though that clip was just a few minutes, uh, it actually went through many renditions of take and the, and the passion that uh, went into its development was really immediately apparent. So thank you for thank you for bringing your voice to this dialogue. So now I'm gonna introduce uh, Barbara Bosworth, who we're very lucky to have with us. She's a vaccine nurse by training who brings decades of experience, but she's also an individual in the community who has a tracheostomy. And one thing that she's done far better than I and many of my peers is getting really engaged with the community and using social networks. She's actually been a thought leader in this domain. Myself, I was kind of forced to do my first tweet about a week back, uh, but Barbara has been on many of these message boards, a reliable source of knowledge and wisdom. So she's going to share her own perspective, both from the standpoint of her expertise as a nurse, as well as an individual with the tracheostomy. Hello. So. Um, I've had a trach for 17 years, and I'm still a practicing nurse, although usually just in the fall for vaccines. Um, I am very present on the several Facebook uh, tracheostomy pages. Uh, there's 10 or more of them. And at the end of this presentation, there will be a slide uh, naming many of them. So get ready to do a screenshot toward the end. Um, so I hear a lot from daily Facebook posts on you know, if there's problems or shortages uh, in, in our community. And um, so parts, some parts of the U.S. have shortages of supplies and others do not. It, it's kind of a hit and miss. Um, New Jersey may have shortages, but Albany, New York does not. Um, and it may be too that as, as these COVID patients are discharged, uh, many can have it tracheostomies and so supplies uh, maybe more of an issue uh, because of people having these new traits. Um, so, you know, uh, Puerto Rico especially has, has had problems with them, but they've also had issues with supplies, you know, since the uh, Hurricane Maria in 17. The most frequent items um, that were short um, or, or rationed were the uh, disposal intercannulas, HMEs, and some suction catheters. Um, so again, it varies from the um, um, you know part of the country. So the other thing too is is um, the use of HMEs. A lot of people think that these have bacterial filters, and they do not. The one on the right is is one that's called an HMEF, which has a filter. Um, these are usually in the hospital part of the circuits that anesthesia and critical care use on ventilators. Um, but again, uh, a lot of people think that because it's a heat moisture exchange, kind of they think of it as a filter. Um, but uh, truly, they, they are not. So uh, on personal protective equipment, um, masks are, are an issue. A lot of people have gotten creative. They wear two masks. Um, so some people also, I'm going to show this, uh, this is a, a, what's called a gator, neck gator that motorcyclists motor wear. Um, so, so some people have gotten really creative using masks um, and, and just, you know, extra, extra fabric. Um, so the other complaint I've seen as far as is home health aides not wearing masks. Um, so it's, it's kind of the, the family's responsibility to, I guess, have some masks available. And some families have made gowns for them to work while they are in their homes to kind of keep things clean. Thank you.
Thanks very much for that wonderful presentation, Barbara. So now we're going to uh, introduce Lauren Perlman. Uh, she is at Harvard's Boston's Children's Hospital. She is a respiratory care practitioner and was really one of the founding members of the Critical Care Anesthesia Perioperative Extension Home Ventilator Program. So for the hundreds of you on, the, uh, on this webinar, uh, that's probably a bit of a mouthful and I will uh, confide how I remembered what CAPE is. I just kind of think of Superman and the amazing, somewhat superhuman things uh, that he does. And that's really what this team is about. Uh, they collectively provide an integrated approach to bridging the gap between the inpatient and the outpatient setting that spans both home and work and really allows people to safely and meaningfully move forward with their lives, forging really quite individual associations and connections that are becoming increasingly rare uh, in the world of uh, modern medicine. So with that, Lauren, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your own experience, uh, both uh, as relates to the history of the CAPE program and specifically in the context of the pandemic. Thank you very much, Michael. So happy to be here with the entire group around the world on this webinar. And uh, yes, uh, fortunately, Boston Children's Hospital did recognize the need for some help transitioning children from the hospital to home. As we know now, just like we have Sally and Jenny, many children are and young adults going home with life support. So it's to bridge that gap. And I'm very fortunate to be supported by Dr. Graham's program to be able to be with uh, these children and young adults and infants. Uh, as Barb had mentioned, right now during this COVID uh, pandemic, there are inconsistencies in shortages and deliveries of the durable medical equipment, be it disposable stuff or actual machines themselves and it does vary state by state. Barb actually told me about a story in, I think it was something in California where they were, you know, some one family told us that someone was gonna come take their ventilators away, which makes no sense. So anyway, um, we're gonna talk about extending the use of your supplies and reusing your tracheostomy tube and some home processing suggestions. So there may be some delivery delays of your equipment, and I would ask you to proactively reach out to your durable medical equipment company to discover what's going on with them and what they anticipate, if they anticipate any issues for you. The supplies on your order list monthly that you're so used to filling out may or may not come as you anticipate. So conserving your current supplies. And in one uh, area, I read about oxygen, that if you have an oxygen concentrator, please try to use that rather than using up your tanks. The concentrator, of course, will run as long as you have electricity. Uh, shortages of specific, specific items, uh, distilled water, there are recipes for that to make on, on the uh, internet. So if that's something you need to use for your tracheostomy tube cleaning, nebulizer, et cetera, or your ventilator humidifier, that's an option. Uh, consider changes in your adjustment of how you change routine equipment. So we're advocating monthly changes for ventilator tubing itself. extended use of supplies. Again, the tracheostomy tube on the Smith Medical website, there are home sterilization techniques there for the Shiley Portex Bavona products. Um, Shiley may have their own that's a little bit different, but you can read about that and try to reuse your tubes, never throw out the last of anything. Uh, the bacteria filters cannot be reprocessed, not that we've been able to, to discern as yet the white sort of UFO looking filter that many people have on the outlet of their ventilators, on the cough machine, for example. Um, as I mentioned, the circuit change for the ventilator, definitely try to push that back. There's no evidence-based medicine in the literature to support that your children or yourself get sick from your ventilator circuit not being changed. So most of the literature just states clearly change it when it's visibly soiled or damaged. Um, as I mentioned earlier, extended use of supplies, even disposable supplies. Some may be dishwasher safe, just check on the internet for the actual instructions for those devices. And um, the self-inflating resuscitation bags that most tracheostomy patients do have, they typically can't be reprocessed because you can't open them up. So consider placing an HME just as a simple catch filter so secretions don't go into the bag and try to extend the life of it. Um, some of the nebulizers can be dishwasher safe and whatnot.
there is a lot of literature about using white vinegar and water one to three mixture so that you can soak your equipment and then rinse it air dry on paper towel use plastic bags to reseal there are other many people use uh, like barb had talked about before just warm water and mild soap for some of your things like speaking valves and caps and it's not recommended to try to process this type of corrugated tubing with the internal ridges as you'll never get the water out it will never dry and i thank you very much for this opportunity to spend time with you today well, thanks so much for those incredible insights that you shared lauren uh, we're really fortunate to have someone with your depth of content expertise in this, as well as someone who's led the charge locally in improving care. As we were warming up for this webinar, uh, Rob, who will here speak in just uh, a few minutes, had commented that if you need a ventilator, Lauren's the one to go to. So apparently she has a stash of them in her closet, as well as knowing how to use them quite well. So uh, thank you for doing everything that you do. So now we're going to take another skip across the pond to uh, hear from Cora O'Leary. So she is a clinical practice specialist or what would be an advanced practice uh, nurse in the US, I believe. Uh, she's really been a guiding light and we're very fortunate to have her with us. She'll talk about her experience from her work at Resilience Advanced Community Care. Um, hey everyone, so thanks Michael and Vincia for having me he here tonight. Um, just wanted, I suppose, to kind of give you a little picture of what's happening in Ireland. Um, our first COVID-19 patient um, was diagnosed on the um, 29th of February, so we're two months into it. Um, I suppose we have restricted our movements here in Ireland since the 16th of March, and we've been in complete lockdown since the 28th of March. Um, in terms of our positive cases, slightly increased. We're just up to um, just over 21,000 now. And only 13% of our patients um, with positive diagnoses have actually required admission so far. Um, ICU admissions, I suppose, in terms of our entire scale of positive cases is quite low. It's actually risen slightly in the last week, just up to 369 out of our deaths. Um, nearly 1,200, over half of that is actually in the community, and our median age is actually 49. We've only had two patients diagnosed in Ireland um, between the 25 to 44 age bracket, so we're quite lucky in, in, in that respect that have needed intensive hospitalisation treatment. We've had very few kids, thankfully, diagnosed in Ireland with it. Um, our tests have taken a huge jump up to just over 215,000. So here in Ireland, we've actually tested every resident in our nursing home setting um, because we've we've realized that, that that's obviously one of our, um, our, our sickest population. I suppose one of the nicest thing, the number came out today is that 70% of people in Ireland have recovered from COVID-19 and they're well in their home. So in terms of what are we doing in the community with our kids with trachs, um, just to say, I suppose we're currently providing care for um, 14 um, children and adults, um, which is actually 1,500 um, nursing and healthcare assistant hours. And the largest service we'd actually provide is 164 hours for a little girl. She's three years old and she's fully ventilated via a tracky. Um, what we have done, very similar to what Erin was saying earlier on, it's so important to have a good pathway worked out with your local hospital. So what we have worked out is that if the, if the child or young person is at home and they get respiratory symptoms, the parents will phone the nurse manager um, or else the, the nurse on shift will. Um, it's up to the parents then. Obviously, all parents have an incredibly good relationship with their consultant physician. So either the parents can ring them or we can ring them for them. It's entirely up to them. Um, what will work out then really with the consultant and the, the physician, it's all about access to an, a rapid swab clinic. And what the nurse manager will then work on doing is just talking to the nursing team and sorting out PP to get into the family home as soon as we possibly can. Um, after this, then following this call, really, in terms of the of the child or young person going into the swab clinic, um, the reason we want them to go into the rapid swab clinic is because there's a 24 hour turnaround. Um, up to last week in Ireland, it was taking 10 days to get a community swab done and the test result back, which is an incredibly long time. Um, so we have it down, thankfully, to 24 hours in this in this rapid access clinic. Um, while the young person is there, they will get a medical review. If they're stable and they require minimal changes in their care, they will be discharged home. 
they can have their ventilator settings changed, oxygen can be commenced, um, a nebulizer might be changed to inhalers to, to reduce the um, aerosol generating procedures. And our hope is that if they're not very unwell, obviously to come home with advice and support is needed. Obviously medications may be started. Um, a lot of the families tend to get a dry antibiotic so that if it's needed to be made up, the nurses can actually make it up in the house and start it if needed. Um, and then in terms of what the nurse manager does, um, in terms of their role then, um, they're really going to be organising the PPE into, into the family home. There is a shortage all over the world. We're no different here in Ireland. But what our nurse managers have is an emergency pack for 24 hours. It's got a number of gowns, gloves, masks, um, and either goggles or a face visor. Um, and they will then just put those emergency packs in the house. Um, obviously, we'll have the results in 24 hours. If we need more equipment, that's absolutely fine. But having the emergency pack in, it just gives us that, that, that window to get more as we need it. Um, in terms of education videos nationally, um, there are ones for COVID-19 specific, and there's also ones for donning and doffing PP in the community. And we are... Um, we are pushing all of our nurses to obviously do it now before they actually need to um, use all the PPE to have them all ready to go. In terms of further education and support then, um, we want the, the, our nurses to feel happy and confident and comfortable going into a COVID-19 potential house um, to just support them as best as we can. Obviously support the family as well, which is a big thing. And this is probably where I come in quite a lot, really. Um, I've done a cheat sheet just to give extra help and advice, what they should and shouldn't do in terms of, you know, disconnecting the ventilator, turning off the ventilator first before actually disconnecting the um, tubing. Um, so we've done a cheat sheet. We've done, done some Zoom videos as well, just on giving um, an inhaler via a tracheostomy. Um, and just bagging in a neb as well if needed. Um, and then obviously, if um, if a child is COVID-19 and a nurse is anxious when they're going in, they can contact me via Zoom or WhatsApp and I can just do, do a video call to help and guide them um, just to make sure that they're okay and everything is safe in the house. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cora, for a wonderful talk, and, and in particular for striking a note of optimism in what's a fairly difficult time for many of us. It's really wonderful to hear about the approaches that you've taken in Ireland. And now we're going to hear from Louise Edwards, who I didn't have the good fortune to know until we were organizing this webinar, but has really done some fairly impressive things in the United Kingdom. So Louise is a speech, what we would call in the US a speech language pathologist or in the UK, a consultant speech and language therapist. One of the things that I've really come to appreciate is that whereas we who have uh, MDs or, or medical degrees behind our name, we often fixate on it, just keeping our patients alive and well and avoiding complications. When you actually go out, whether into the community or on the hospital floors and you ask patients what really matters to them, what they care about, it's really the quality of life issues. It's whether they can talk, it's their communication, their speech, their swallowing, what they can eat. And those domains really are the bread and butter, what's done every day by people like Louise. She's actually distilled an incredible amount of material very thoughtfully in an understandable way that could probably uh, cover an hour into a few minutes. So with that, I'll let you get underway, Louise. Thank you so much for what you do every day and for sharing some of those insights with us on this webinar. Thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. I have to say I'm absolutely privileged to do a job I love, so um, that's definitely where it comes from, and, and we're all part of that big team. I just really want to set the scene about supporting, particularly in these difficult times, but also beyond to help um, individuals with tracheostomies, particularly if we're thinking about tube changes and moving from cuffed, um, moving to cuffed tubes. So just reminding ourselves that um, People with a cuffless tube or cuff down have the potential, and I say that carefully because not everybody can, but to get um, airflow up to their glottis, to their voice box, and then to be able to use that for voice and for cough and swallow. And this is really important. And for some people also one-way valve placement, but again, to be mindful that that's not always possible. And even in this situation where we have all this opportunity, we're still optimizing communication opportunities. If we move to a cuff up situation or a cuff tube, 
we may find that we have a change to that pattern. So we're unable to get voice, we're unable to get airflow to the larynx and move it so that we can use it for cough, swallow and voice. And if we think about a deteriorating or, or an unwell individual, um, this potentially could be what happens. And that's a real change. And I think sort of listening to some of our speakers uh, and certainly as Michael's introduction said, loss of your voice can be a real loss of identity. It can create fear and it can create anxiety. So what we want to think about is, is how we support um, children and adults with, with this change. So a busy slide, I apologize, but really wanted to emphasize that we're really informed by international guidance and, and I've been lucky to listen in on to the, some of the GTC webinars. Um, also listened into a European um, uh, paediatric otolaryngology one recently, our own national tracheostomy safety project and a number of other services including TRAMS that we've mentioned and our own Royal College have really informed what we as clinicians do. Speech and language therapists do a lot of aerosol generating procedures. And so whilst we do them clinically as an assessment, these will be going on in the home setting. And in, uh, as Erin's slides pointed out earlier, in a family situation where you have no external people in, we wouldn't expect you to be putting PPE on and we would expect you to be functioning as normal. We may not be initiating, for example, one-way valve assessments or one-way valve pro progress, but we might be thinking about what we can do to support. We would expect healthcare professionals to continue to support if they're in full PPE. This is not about stopping people moving forward. It really is about continuing. For some people, it would be the, the difference between staying on a ventilator and getting off a ventilator. So we need to be pragmatic and positive about how we move forward. Some of the recommendations we heard from TRAMS recently um, to put a face mask over the mouth during uh, one-way valve trials because obviously that's the direction of the airflow as this picture shows. Um, and it's important that you do liaise, you know, particularly for families with your tertiary centre, particularly regarding plans around cuff deflation, one-way valve placement and weaning plans. They're there to support and we're doing lots of these Zoom contacts and MS teams. There's so much going on. We're here to help. So definitely get in touch and let's see what we can plan. I think it's fair to say, and, and I'm delighted that Sally demonstrated this on her beautiful video with her mum, that communication is more than spoken word. If we put me on mute now, you'd still see that I was madly communicating passionately about speech and language therapy and about children and young people and adults with tracheostomies that make me proud. It is about facial expression. It is about so much more. When that's removed, when a voice is removed, it really can challenge that, that perception. But we want to think about what the bigger picture is. Acknowledging that there might be a communication breakdown in a person that has moved, for example, to a cuff tube saying, I really can see you're trying to tell me something, but your voice is hiding. We use this a lot with children. Um, your voice is hiding, or I can see you're trying to talk, but at the moment it's not coming through. Even without voice leak, people might be able to mouth words. So remember to look carefully at their lips and try it out yourself. Mimic what they're doing to try and understand what they're saying. Whatever method of communication a person is using, optimize it, repair it. Where's the breakdown? If they're making a facial expression, interpret. Try and offer commentary rather than questioning. Questioning can be quite tiresome, a huge cognitive load. And as hard as it is to say, we have to accept the limitations in the current climate. It is really difficult and we have to understand that particularly when we're emblazoned in PPE, it's really difficult to get our message across and instill confidence. Do liaise with your speech language pathologist and do make sure you connect with them to give more advice. Some really practical tips. These are probably really obvious, but having just done a video today for our teams where I've put all the PPE on and really tried to show how to combat this challenge of communication. One of the most important things is there's so many hello, my name is badges out there. Get one, just your picture, just your first name. We use a symbol on the back to show our job. Put it on top of your PPE. It can be cleaned regularly. Use your hands to indicate a choice. Do you want the cup? or the spoon, keep it near your face, that's the direction they're likely to look, even in full PPE. Use objects, use pictures. Use natural gesture, 
I don't know. It expresses a lot without the words. You can use signing systems that use spoken word as well, such as Makaton. And if you're in full PP, this is primarily for healthcare professionals, you can use tactile signing, so something like tassels, that is really confidence building for children and young people, particularly, or adults with learning difficulties that really don't have a good expressive, um, receptive language. Make picture boards, simple pictures that you can choose from. You can make these yourself. There are many downloadable um, widget and board maker are available, some of them free. And one of the big ones we're trying to say is, particularly for young people um, or people with mental health problems or with challenges, to use social stories where you explain why we're wearing PPE and why it's important and the importance of communicating feelings. Do it daily so it builds confidence. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Louise. Uh, it's just so obvious that the passion that you bring, it just shines through in everything that you say. And uh, I, I could almost see you as a career in, in uh, acting and performance, but maybe that there is an aspect <laughs> of that in what we each do. So, so now we are going to transition to Rob Graham, who is our anchor speaker. Uh, he is the uh, director of the Kate program. And he also happens to be the individual who gave us the uh, wonderful title that we have for this webinar about navigating public health crises. He's going to speak to the issues around advocacy. One of the wonderful things about being on a virtual presentation is that he can't touch me or break my jaw. So I can say that uh, if this is the Cape program, this is perhaps Superman. We can uh, revel in his chiseled good looks. Uh, but we also know that behind every impressive man is a rather surprised woman who perhaps is uh, Lauren and any number of other members of the CAPE team. Uh, so thank you for fearlessly leading the charge with this. He is in the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Medicine at the world-renowned Boston Children's Hospital. So take it away. Oh my God, thank you. Um, yeah, that's uh, quite the introduction. Um, and uh, I, I do have a huge you know, uh, support network with our team, with Lauren, and um, we have two nurse practitioners, uh, a social worker, and uh, another colleague of mine that we work with. Um, and it does take a team, and all the families we work with. Um, I'll just, for uh, disclosures, um, I, the photos that I've used, I have permission from the families. And, um, you know, really, I, I think I wanna echo everything that Sally and Jenny said, that Louise and Cora, and I think Cora's program that's called Resilience really speaks to you know, what I think everyone uh, is required to be at this point. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think I want to sort of dovetail sort of some of the practical things with sort of a general approach to how we want to think about advocacy. Um, and it isn't just for the COVID crisis. I think this is, a lot of this is going to be applicable for other, you know, whether it be a natural disaster or sort of, you know, family crises that go on. And uh, I have to thank for this slide, uh, you know, the little um, Cape Calm and Carry On was given to us by uh, one of our families that we work with. Um, for those that don't know, the little thingies at the top are actually carry, uh, caper berries, uh, if, you like your, uh, if you like them in salads or otherwise. Um, but I think, you know, as we've sort of navigated this with our families and, and uh, you know, working with Erin and, and her husband Will, uh, and, or rather her son Will and her husband Mark and, and others, We've learned a lot uh, in this. Um, you know, uh, I thought we knew a lot, but we've learned a lot more. Um, and first of all, I think it's easy to recognize that you know the group of people with tracheostomies is, is not a uniform group. Uh, you don't have all similar conditions. Um, you know, what you need for your supports are different. You know, it's an international group as we're working with today. Um, everyone has different resources, and so recognizing that's crucial. Um, I think all of us uh, need to sort of acknowledge and appreciate that there's implicit bias from the medical community, especially at time of crisis, for anyone with a special health care need. And it just goes without saying. And, and I, you know, there's a lot on the various blogs and some more overtly than others um, about limiting care for people with chronic conditions. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the advocacy. And, and I think it's, it's good to call out. We need to. And then I think we really do need to, and, and actually the GTC as a platform is doing just this, is thinking about our own roles in advocacy within the community of people with tracheostomies and, and sort of the broader community and, and how do we sort of, um, you know, speak up, uh, acknowledge the needs, but also acknowledge the strengths. Um, you know, we have a lot of families who have said, 
you know, to the global community to say, welcome to our world. We've been cautious about this stuff forever. Um, and I think it's it's worth saying that, you know, that the community of, of individuals with tracheostomies, the, the, those individuals and their families have a lot to offer and teach. Um, you know, as we go forward, you know, um, there are some practical things that we've definitely, um, all aspects that uh, I think Louise and Cora and, and uh, you know, Barb, everyone has, has spoken to requires someone to be a squeaky wheel to to advocate. And I think, you know, I, I've broken down a few of the points here that, you know, with home care, you know, trying to advocate and speak up and say, you know, this is not a time to cut our nursing hours or our personal uh, care assistant hours. Um, people are self-restricting that. And I think Aaron's slide in terms of determining, you know, who do you want in your home? Um, and are they actually, you know, uh, accommodating? Are they doing social distancing? And, and I've worked with families and and uh, to decide, you know, in fact, actually, they, they're going to take on more of that responsibility themselves, recognizing that that's, that's hard. I mean, sustainability for an indeterminate period of time without supports is challenging. Um, you know, advocating for your nurses to get PPE. I think Cora spoke to that. That is not uniform. Um, and, you know, how do we do that? You know, is it an out-of-pocket expense to you? Um, should it be provided by agencies or, or the hospitals or, or what have you? I think it's, it's worth exploring and, and exchanging in the community, you know, how do you to sort of troubleshoot that? Um, banking, you know, so if you're not using hours that now, see if you can roll them over and, and save them for the future. And I think the safety and advocacy in, in that, and, and this applies to home care and employers is, you know, mitigating exposure is key. And so, you know, a young man, um, you know, up in New Hampshire and sort of Northern New England, um, his personal care assistants didn't believe, they still believe this is somewhat of a hoax. And so I've said to him, it's like, you make that decision and you don't allow them in your home and you work with family and friends that are willing and able to and, and, and sort of abide by it. So you have to advocate for yourself. Um, most employers are allowing for remote uh, access, um, you know, and, you know, and, you know, the questions of being furloughed or being fired if they don't, um, you know, I think that's another thing you can advocate for legal uh, uh, avenues that you should be retained, that they need to make those allowances and that, you know, you can't put yourself or your family member at risk. Um, Schools have been very accommodating, um, and obviously, as uh, as we emerge from this at varying paces, um, you know, it's it's unclear as to when schools are going to resume, uh, depending on your region and and country. Um, and so, uh, advocate early. Um, you know, in the northern hemisphere, we're going into summer vacation. I think we're Sally and Jenny are, and uh, and otherwise, you guys are sort of headed into uh, into winter. Um, but, you know, for those in, in the Northern Hemisphere, trying to get those uh, IEPs or the 504s in place uh, in North America or the individualized plans in the UK and elsewhere, um, getting those in place in the summer, anticipating that we may still have these needs in the fall when we resume uh, schools. Um, Wi-Fi access, crucial. Um, you can, you know, there are public assistance programs. Um, actually, some of the uh, some of the communication companies are actually providing free services for for families. Reach out. Therapies, I think, as Louise says, get creative. Reach out to your speech language pathologist. Um, uh, you know, reach out to your OT, your PT. Um, a lot of them are doing telehealth. Uh, even if they're not, some are standing out on your front yard. Uh, they're willing to do a lot of things. They are as dedicated a group uh, as anyone. And so I think we need to sort of think about uh, you know being creative uh, as we as you usually are, um, and actually just sort of extrapolating that to other things. Um, I do think uh, you know as a, as a physician, I think I need to advocate for you to say you need to get your routine care. That's vaccinations. That's you know checkups. Some of those can be virtual. Some of them do have to be in person. Um, you know, most hospitals have canceled a lot of elective surgeries. Is that spinal fusions? Is that tonsillectomies? You know, is it a routine bronchoscopy that you need for your um, for your tracheostomy and, and airway evaluation? Trying to figure out what's elective versus what's urgent or semi-urgent is, is helpful to navigate with your providers because all the hospitals have allowances for that. And then I would actually have to say, you know, the key is also emergency care. Don't delay reaching out to your providers um, because we are seeing, and, and as I spend the time in the ICU, for routine illnesses, we're seeing people come in sicker, unrelated to COVID-19. 
just that they're waiting at home longer because they're worried about coming in and being exposed. And what we don't want is for you to you know, accumulate morbidities and, and other issues because you, you wait to access care. The advocacy stuff is challenging. As I said, you know, um, there are lots of rumors, some valid and some not, um, about discrimination against individuals with special health care needs. And you know, the, the equity and justice and understanding, um, it's crucial to speak out. Um, there's an assumption, a, a bad assumption that people with tracheostomies may not have a good quality of life, that they may have limited length, you know, lengths of lives, you know, and, and a lack of understanding is necessarily why you even need it. Um, and so I think it's crucial to speak up. Um, in the U.S., each state has different what we call crisis standards of care, and these are sort of emergency plans when hospitals are overwhelmed as to how are they going to triage. And I think we heard a lot about that coming out of Italy early in this, and um, you know, hearing to an extent out of New York uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, and elsewhere. And you know, I, I think it is important as advocacy groups to speak up and say, in fact, actually, this is who we are. Um, you know, our quality of lives are good, um, and our health is important. And you know, uh, you know, making sure that that's taken into account is states or provinces or countries are actually uh, implementing these things. And uh, you know, without, uh, without speaking up, you won't have a voice. Um, and just as I sort of wrap up, I just say it's crucial, reach out. Reach out to your teams. It doesn't matter who it's comprised of. It could be physician, it could be nurse practitioner, it could be your therapist, um, it could be a local politician uh, if they know you. Um, and just reach out and, and ask for help early. Um, so I wanna say thanks to the GTC, um, Michael and, and Vincia and, and the rest of the uh, you know presenters and Aaron Ward especially is, is one of the families we work with and the rest of my team so thank you hey thanks Rob for absolutely hitting it out of the park I covered so much ground in such a little time that was really remarkable I wanted to especially thank you for calling out the efforts of the GTC uh, as well as calling out in a number of other areas that are particularly important. I think the notion of implicit bias is something that is grossly under-recognized. It is absolutely operating as relates to the care of our patients who have tracheostomy. It also is well-documented uh, as a function of ethnic background uh, and uh, minorities who may be marginalized. And if you happen to have a tracheostomy and be a minority, those issues may be especially acute. The points about crisis standards of care is extremely relevant in this time. For those who aren't familiar with that concept, it basically refers to the idea that the way that we do business, the way that a hospital operates, can be modified in the setting of crisis with the kind of utilitarian goal of saving as many lives as possible. But the problem arises is when these formulas are inherently imperfect. Uh, so you can see how this would play out if an individual who had tracheostomy was seen as having poor health or less uh, ability to overcome infection, they may not receive the same standard of care. This is also extremely relevant to those who may be African American or from another minority who may have a higher risk of morbidities and already a greater risk of mortality um, from serious infection and then may be asked to effectively take a seat further back in the line. So I think that the ethical challenges are significant. That's actually going to be a theme that we delve into more as we look at our future webinar. So, so thank you for all of those wonderful, wonderful insights. Uh, advocacy is, is sometimes seen as being something of a godfly, but I can say that as your talk shows, and as we see time and again, that some of the most altruistic people basically helping to stand up for people who may otherwise have difficulty standing for themselves or those who are advocates. So thank you for what you do each day. So at this point, we're going to be transitioning into our question and answer. I do wanna take just a moment to make a plug. Uh, there were a uh, hundred of you or actually a little bit better who completed our pre-webinar survey. Your voices are extremely important. We wanna hear from you, know what's going on, and these surveys are the best way to do it and to tailor our content. Uh, if everyone or as many as people as possible could take what will be a very short survey, about three minutes at the end of this uh, session, that would be great. I'm gonna turn it over to Vincia for the Q&A. Vincia, by the way, has worked tirelessly in assimilating all of the different talks in preparation to a cohesive webinar. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Michael. But before we move to the Q&A session, I wanted to take a moment to share uh, Josh's story here. We've been talking about how communication is so crucial 
um, and how that could be addressed in a, a hospital setting. So just wanted to show a quick clip here um, for you to appreciate what can be done even during this COVID crisis. Joshua lives with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and just a few weeks ago ended up in ICU with a chest infection. It was basically you had the option of getting the track put in or just slowly passing away. We got the track done and it's just been amazing since. Following the tracheostomy, Josh is now on a ventilator at the Austin Hospital where speech pathologist Daphne is helping him use the new video on wheels device. They're being rolled out in the wake of social distancing restrictions. Communication, it's a healthcare right, it's a human right and really we see that with Josh when his, his face absolutely lights up when he's speaking to his family. These devices are all thanks to more than 1,200 generous donors. In just 10 days, enough money was raised to purchase 40 of them for the hospital. It just makes every day go a bit quicker and helps me recover. Um, so with that quick video, I'm going to transition uh, to the Q&A session. Um, I really was able to appreciate only two um, uh, important questions, and they both are directed to um, Laura, uh, Lauren. Um, Barb was talking about the HME, so there's a question asking if you could clarify the difference between uh, different types of HMEs and specifically the ones with the filter. Hi, the uh, HME, uh, Barb uh, filled me in actually on an HME with a filter that's used specifically in the operating room on an anesthesia device. So that particular one isn't used in the home care world. Uh, the standard HME, which has the white tight fitting on most of them, a few are green, which is very interesting color uh, to put on the HME. Uh, we just don't know how the HME would filter the virus as far as particulate. That's why she showed the picture of the very lengthy covering nose, mouth, and over your neck with regard to, to cloth. So it's not going to be an N95 mask, which protects you from inhaling the virus directly. But if you're in uh, a room with other people, if everyone is protecting uh, their actual uh, viral load, if they have it coming out of their airway, then you would be protected in that way. Um, if you have a tracheostomy tube with a balloon or cuff inflated, then of course you're breathing directly through the tracheostomy tube. But that doesn't mean that your eyes, nose, and mouth cannot receive uh, the virus. Mm -hmm. Do you think that answers the question? Uh, okay. Yes, thank you, Lauren. Rob, did you want to chime in based on your experiences in the ICU as well, if they're using any filters and different types of HMEs? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, um, we're, we're definitely using, um, you know, the ventilator filters are intended for that, um, for, for sort of trapping things. Most of the community HMEs or, or otherwise really aren't, um, yeah, most of, we don't know. They're not really intended for sort of viral particulate matter. Um, but what we are doing, and, and as I thought about Louise uh, speaking about using cuff down and, and, and otherwise, is that we are saying that, you know, if your cuff is down, wearing a mask because there's airflow in and out of your nose and mouth uh, is, is crucial. Um, the one thing, and I think Lauren spoke to, is that HMEs are not, you know, they're, they're meant to be disposable. Um, we can't clean them. Uh, once they're soiled, they're soiled. And so turning them over as we sort of think about supply and availability is, is something that uh, we've got to take into account. Mm -hmm. Um, Louise, uh, did you want to chime in as well with your perspective from UK? Yeah, just to say um, that there is a uh, specific uh, micron bacteria HME by a company called ATOS uh, called ExtraCare, and it's a dome-like shape that goes onto a tracheostomy. We have a couple of young people that do use it. It's quite big, so it's not ideal for younger children, and it'd be great if, it, if we did have something like that. Um, but that's specifically targeting um, bacteria viruses. Uh, thank you, Louise. Uh, the second question is um, about water bags for the ventilator tubings. Uh, so the question is, what do we do if we run out of them? The answer for that would be that you could uh, make your own distilled water at home and either independently fill the humidifier or for a period of time use the same bag. A lot of people will 
cut the top of the bag and fill it with water if they have the type of humidification that keeps itself at a certain level. But there is a way to make distilled water. Fortunately, we have not. I've not heard of any shortages. Um, and I see distilled water for sale at the general markets in our area. So I hope that that won't happen to any of you. But there is an interesting way to make it online with pots and double boilers and ice. I had never seen it before until I looked it up myself. Mm -hmm. We've also recommended for those who, if, if you run out of water, uh, you can use a dry circuit with inline HMEs and you may require additional saline installation or other things just to keep airway humidification. Um, you know, in adults, it's very common. They're not on, you know, humidified circuits most of the day if they're on a ventilator. Um, for Children, it's it's more of an issue, and you know you're balancing your secretions being dry versus wet. But um, there are some temporizing things. So using using inline HME, use more saline nebs. Um, mm -hmm. It's an option, if, if, mm -hmm. you know, if you have to. Thank you, Lauren and Rob. Um, there is a follow-up question here um, about how to safely clean the heated wire tubing for ventilators, um, especially since they've been um, in a situation where they have to use it for longer periods of time? We are, we are advocating at least a month unless visibly oh. soiled or malfunctioning. And that can be extended longer. There, I've looked, um, the you know American Association for Respiratory Care, uh, the physician organizations, in the literature, nothing says that your child is going to get sick from their own ventilator tubing if you don't clean it. So certainly if it malfunctions or doesn't look right to you, you could use the vinegar, white vinegar and water, one third, two thirds solution, but it's very difficult to dry the inside and rinse it out well with the ridges on the inside. It's corrugated tubing. If you happen to have BiPAP tubing, which is flat on the inside for your ventilator, which can be used, uh, then that would be much easier to clean at home. But I, you know, the recommendation at least in the literature, is that you need not be concerned about the ventilator tubing unless visibly soiled, and it's something that you're doing more for aesthetics than for the actual mm -hmm. patient's health. Thank you, Lauren. Um, there is a follow-up question for Louise. Um, there were some questions requesting clarification about um, what PPE entails when it comes to doing um, speaking valve trials. Good question. Um, there is still lots of debate about this and um, we're very lucky that the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists has made it very clear that this is um, an aerosol generating procedure, an AGP. Um, the current recommendation, and I'll be honest, it changes all the time, so I apologise, um, is an FFP3 mask uh, with goggles or visor and gown. Um, is my understanding, um, but I understand colleagues are also using the um, surgical fluid resistant mask. I think um, it's being mindful of kind of, particularly in the early trials of a one-way valve, um, the concerns are you do got to get a lot of secretion movement or you can get a lot of secretion movement. And I think it's minimizing that impact. Um, I also emphasize the fact that clinicians are often working with other children and families. So this really is about safeguarding everybody um, and ensuring that you're not taking a cross. Um, so the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists have guidance freely available on their website. I know the Irish Speech and Language Therapy in New Zealand, ASHA, so the American, it, it is available. It's It's been tricky because as um, uh, Rob kindly pointed out that the challenges we have and to call out, um, but initially our guidance, we weren't included in being considered as healthcare professionals that are involved in AGPs. Um, I'll try not to get on my soapbox about it, um, but it's really important that it is recognized we are generating sputum in a lot of the stuff we do, dysphagia, so swallowing assessments and one-way valves. Um, so we need to be safeguarding ourselves and also the people we're working with. Um, it, it was slightly different to Public Health England, so that's why we've got a statement out um, from our Royal College. Thank you, Louise. We have one last question. I'll just, well, actually, Vince, yeah, I'll, I'll just chime in there for a moment to thank you, Louise, for getting on your soapbox for a moment, because I, in my personal opinion, it's nothing short of a travesty that they wouldn't recognize the speech language pathology community as being frontline workers at risk. Indeed, they may be at greater risk than some of the surgeons or other 
practitioners that are nurses because the activities that you do when you're when you're modifying or changing a prosthesis or doing a variety of provocative tests uh, are certainly very high risk. And uh, actually, Vincia has been involved uh, with uh, Marty Brodsky uh, in developing a consensus statement that actually speaks to the need for guidance and materials available for advocacy. I don't know if, uh, Vincia, you want to say anything or, or if Lucy has a perspective. No, I think um, hopefully once that um, consensus statement comes out, it will serve as a good resource for speech pathologists who are trying to figure out what is the best way to take care of these patients, especially uh, when they're doing um, assessments of speech and also doing um, valuations with a cup up or a cup down. Um, there is one, um, actually, I'm going to try and summarize the last few questions, and these are all surrounding um, small children with a tracheostomy, and there's a huge concern about them being at a higher risk. Um, and there is one uh, caregiver here who mentioned that they've completely isolated themselves. They have not gone outside in a couple of months, and as their child is growing, they're wondering uh, whether that would affect their growth and development. And so, um, is it safe to go out for a walk? What are your thoughts? I think this question is really directed towards Rob. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I mean, mental health is a big part of this, um, and uh, being able to get out and seeing people virtually is not the same. Uh, seeing people even across the street is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think we also have to appreciate that um, we're in this for a long time. I mean, even as people reach sort of a plateau period, um, we don't really have a sense as to how long that's going to be. Um, and so you do have to take into account, yeah, development and normal activity. We, I guess, firstly, internationally, we haven't seen that children are at any greater risk. There are some new phenomenon that we're seeing, and, and you'll hear reports of um, uh, unusual rashes, something called Kawasaki disease, which may or may not be related. Uh, it's, a, it's a known entity. Um, uh, it's been around uh, described for decades. Um, and so we're learning a little bit more. Are there unique manifestations in children? Um, in people who are otherwise immunocompetent, um, and most people with tracheostomies are, um, you know, we wouldn't expect them to have any greater risk. And so I, I think we have to assume that Yes, you can, although no one can guarantee without risk, start to assume a little bit of activity. Social distancing is the key. So contact precautions, the distancing, the masks, um, and otherwise is, cru is crucial, but also getting out from a mental health and development perspective uh, cannot be under underestimated, the value in that. I mean, it is uh, it is gonna be important um, because we could be in the same position in a month or even two months or longer, and. Uh, and there's a lot of value, especially for children. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, we all have to be. Resilience is crucial, but it, you know, also having a degree of sort of normalcy and hope there is is very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Thanks Rob. Yeah, that was absolutely pitch perfect. I'd just like to second those remarks. I've I've studied some of the science uh, behind the social distancing and. Uh, you know, it's, it's reasonably high level evidence that is derived from prior pandemics as well as empiric scientific experiments. It's been published in the most prestigious journals from Journal of the American Medical Association to Lancet to the New England Journal. I think that it's a long game and uh, we really do have to get out there and see the sun. And, uh, you know, as long as we uh, adhere to those best practices and social distancing, I think that's sound advice. Sorry, Vince, I'll give it. I sent a you, tweet Michael. to our patients that hug a tree, they're virus free. Mm. Um, I know earlier Barb uh, mentioned about some tracheostomy support groups. I was wondering if you can enlighten us a little bit more because there were some questions in the chat box about that. Um, Sounds like she may be muted. Mm -hmm. Or uh, Aaron, do you want to take this question? Sure. And Barb, if you come on, you can jump right in. But um, there are several Facebook groups. Um, I have to call out um, tracheostomy.com actually was one of the original um, websites for tracheostomy care. And 
they used to do what was called at the time, um, you know, like Google chat groups and things like that. And so then we eventually wound up on Facebook. And you can see from this slide that there are several of them. Um, this is a great place to connect to hear about what else is happening in the community, especially during this time. It's also a great place if you're running low on supplies consistently almost every day on the on some of the sites um, they're posting equipment and you just pay for shipping um, through either PayPal or Venmo um, so it's a really incredible resource and and it, I really highly encourage you to explore all of them um, you know some of them I think there's just so many because you know someone maybe doesn't know that there's others out there and, and creates a new one um, so you can kind of just participate and see which ones kind of fit your needs or your um, your issues. There's some that are more focused on adult care, like tracheostomy and neck breathers connection, and others like moms to trach babies that is more of a, a younger group. Um, mm -hmm. So they're incredibly helpful. And what's your history with social media, Erin? Yeah, I'm I'm on every day. I run several groups, um, so it's it's a great way to connect with others and to stay current on what the what the issues are. Um, I just want to jump in and chime in here because I'm the host of Tracheostomy Warriors Support Group. So we do have a lot of um, individuals from the community, parents and all um, family members, and also healthcare providers who are par part of that group. And that's really uh, the site where I found Barbara um, because she uh, is an active member in that group and has been giving really valuable advice, being a nurse and a an individual with a tracheostomy tube. So I do um, want to encourage you to consider all of these depending on what your needs are. Erin, um, do you mind talking a little bit about the patient and family? Um, sure, we're, we're very fortunate that the GTC has really prioritized engaging patients and families from the beginning. So we have a membership that's free to all patients and families and caregivers. So you can just visit our website and on the main screen, you just go to the tab under patients and families and you'll see these photos. And then there's also um, right on this page lower, there'll be a place to enter your information. The information is just for the GTC. It's not shared with others. And um, you can receive the emails and stay connected to what's happening with the GTC. We also have a patient and family committee that meets once a month and if you're someone that's interested in being more involved you can certainly email the GTC and be directed to, to participate in those as well. Thank you Erin. Um, so at this um, point I want to just introduce the emails or contact information of all of our panelists here and I want to thank each one of you for spending this um, afternoon or early morning. I know for Sally and Jenny, it's like six in the morning in Australia. So thank you for joining us. Um, a link to today's webinar uh, recording will be sent within the next 24 to 48 hours. So please um, take your time to watch it and also share it with your friends and colleagues um, who were unable to attend this session. And as um, Michael was alluding to earlier, uh, many of you took the pre-webinar survey, and so we want to thank you for that. And uh, we are going to be sending you another link to get an understanding of what your needs are and what questions are um, truly important for you or are unanswered so we can uh, hone into those topics for our upcoming webinars. Um, and we're also going to be starting to give some certificates of attendance uh, so if you um, fill out those post-webinar surveys, um, we'll be sending some certificate of attendance your way. Um, and Michael, do you want to chime in and talk a little bit about this? Uh, well, not too much, but uh, more than anything, I just want to thank uh, all the people who are participants in this webinar, and uh, as well as our speakers, uh, Aaron, Louise, Cora, Barb, Lucy, Rob, for bearing the torch and supporting the needs of those in the community. Uh, you're really uh, furthering the mission that is the same one that we have in Global Tracheostomy Collaborative, which is to improve the lives and safety of all patients with the tracheostomy. Uh, any contributions that anybody uh, may wish to make to uh, further those goals is greatly appreciated and can be done through the website. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, we do want to put in a plug for our next webinar, which is going to be on May 19th 
at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be talking about some of the ethical considerations and equity as well that Rob alluded to earlier today during the talk. Uh, so we want to invite you and um, save the date. Um, so thank you all again. At the oh, yeah, and a special thanks to Sally and Jenny for joining us on this particular session. It's We are so thrilled to have you here, and it's wonderful to see you waving your hand. Yeah, and a, a big thank you to Barb as well. Um, I know we kind of lost her towards the end, but really appreciate her um, sharing her I think she was really the voice of the people on the Facebook and sharing some of the questions uh, and needs that they're facing every day. So thank you all and see you in about two weeks. Thank you.